Okay, I think it's uh, time to begin the webinar. Um, yes, hello, welcome to this special webinar on uh, one study for presentations, how to share your research in any conference format. Uh, where we'll go through the four presentation types, uh, two minute presentations, 10 minute presentations, the conference poster and display materials, and how each is used to communicate a particular study in its own unique way. We'll start with the spoken presentations in part one, before moving on to the more visual presentations in part two. Um, my name is Simon Clark, I'm the uh, European Geoscience Union's Projects Coordination Officer, and joining me, we have two speakers with experience in presentation design and delivery. We have Maria Reina Ramos, research scientist in hydrology and president of the EDU Division on Hydrological Sciences and co-chair of the Programme Committee for the EDU 23 uh, General Assembly. Um, we also have Fabio Crameri, a freelance researcher and science-related graphic designer um, interested in open access and community review sharing platforms. We'll be delivering uh, the second part. There'll be time towards uh, the end for questions. If you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Now we'll begin the webinar proper. So what is the study we'll be using today? We're using the particular study, the impact of the quality of hydrological forecasts on enlargement and revenue of hydroelectric reservoirs, a conceptual approach. Um, we'll be providing some general tips about the given presentation style, and I'll just our speakers will discuss how to take the study and transform it into something that is communicable and accessible for each of the given presentation styles. Uh, it is not so important to know the structured area or the details of the study properly, as the tips given today will be uh, applicable generally. However, if you are interested in getting to know it a little deeper, the study is available on open access on the EGU Sphere publishing platform and online repository. So you need to only follow the uh, reference provided. Moving on to our first presentation format, we have the two minute presentation, which has become increasingly popular in conferences. Um, this is sometimes accompanied by an hour long session after where the audience can engage with a more interactive homepage, accompanied by the presenter where discussion can happen in more detail. At the EGU General Assembly, for example, this happens in the form of PICO sessions. So these sessions are essentially a high impact teaser to grab your audience's attention and draw them to your interactive spot for the session later. Some key points to keep in mind and that will be expanded upon later will be that short presentations are its own format. It's inappropriate to try and fit a longer presentation style into your two minute format, for example. Try to minimize your content um, maximum of three slides, but even one slide is ideal here. Um, to focus on one key message and use simple language, as jargon can be both inaccessible and choke up your time. It also helps to people navigate, help people to navigate to your interactive spot if your session includes one. Um, and also feel free to use imagination. These two minute presentation slots often have a, a variable often are flexible in terms of the content and media provide. So it could be a single graphic or perhaps a key animation that really hits your message home. So with that, I'd like to move on to uh, Maria Helena to begin her section. Thank you very much, Simon, and um, for this introduction. So hello, everybody. And I found that it would be nice to start with what you do not want when you're presenting a PICO presentation, for instance. So uh, keep in mind, you do not want to tell everything you have written in that paper. Papers are long, explain everything in detail. So you do not have time for that. You do not want to overwhelm, overwhelm sorry, your audience with too much text or tables or images that are too busy. You also do not want to go through your presentation as fast as you can. So, oh, finally, it's soon over. No, no. You do not want to avoid questions. You're here in the conference to get feedback. And of course, you don't want just to present and then disappear from Earth. So that's finally if you get on that. So finally, what do you want? If you proposed an abstract for a PICO session or you got a, a PICO uh, presentation, what do you want? 
do you want to tell your audience about your work, to tell them about your most important finds, to get the feedback about your methods and results? Do you want to make your audience uh, curious about, want to know more about what you do? And of course, maybe you also want to gain your own communication skills. You probably here uh, want uh, basically everything. Like, if you want everything of that after your presentation, you have to think about uh, the things you have to do to get that. You have to tell them a story. You have to think about it. What is the story I'm going to tell from my work? You have to select some takeaways. You cannot present everything. You want a feedback? You have to leave time for questions. This is very important. Think about that. You also wanted to make the audience curious, want to know more. So you have to encourage them to come to talk to you after the session, to ask the questions, but also to come to talk to you after the session. So you have to fix the attention of the audience audience into you and your work. And of course, if you wanted to gain communication skills, it's not only preparing and give the presentations, you have to practice it before also. And then you also can give your own feedback to yourself, whatever, if that exists. You just present and then you say, okay, I did as I expected to do or not. Basically, you have to make sure that what you're going to prepare as a presentation will serve this purpose that you identified. If you want all this, you have to make sure that what you prepare are going to re respond to that. Okay, so the paper as an example that we decide to take. So let's take in it. And first of all, when you start a, um, a presentation, whatever it is, first of all, a question you have to ask yourself, how much time do I have? This timing is very, very important for our presentations in particular, because when you're giving a time limit, specific time limit, you have to respect it. So keep it that in mind. This is very important. Now, we are here to talk about some short presentations and longer presentations. What are the difference between them? What are the common features? So starting with the two minute pitch talk, like in a pico spot, as Simon explained to you. So step one, uh, what I, my tips, or at least what I advise is to first picture yourself. Where will I be? And imagine also the audience, who will they be? Look at the session where you were planned to present. Inform yourself about the format. How is it going to happen? Are questions at the end? Are questions in the middle? Are there any discussion time in the middle or before my presentation or at the end? So inform yourself self about the session. Inform yourself about who else is presenting before and after you. This is important also. So then you start to, uh, to be inside your own presentation now, your own session, your conference. So here you are. This is a photo in the middle for those who haven't come to you yet. This is a picture, I think, 2016 or 17. I don't know. Can't remember well, but it's a, a picture taken from a Pico spot. So people sitting, watching the screen, and you're going to be there, like this is my lip person here, to uh, give your two-minute uh, pitch. All right. Now. After you picture yourself, you know where you are going to be, you know who is going to be listen to you or who you expect to be there to be listened to you, you have to plan your content. And you have two minutes. If you have two minutes, you can only have one to three slides maximum. As Simon mentioned, even two would be better. But you can go up to three according to how you plan it. But just keep your time limit, two minutes. People usually spend 0 0.8 to 1.2 minutes per slide. So keep that in mind. These are magical figures. No more than two, three messages or information that you put in on a slide. So don't overwhelm your audience. Create curiosity all over your talk, all over your slides. So the first slide could be like, for instance, an opportunity for you to make your aim very clear, to highlight some key issue, one key issue, for instance, if it's the case study you are working that is particular interest to show. Is it the model you're working with or is it the data set? So whatever you have a key issue, put it there. And of course, the first slide, you have to show who you are and where you come from so people can identify the work 
with you. That's the way you can get feedback later. A second slide could be, for instance, you show one simple result. You provide one takeaway that you really grab the attention of the audience, and then you invite the audience to come and talk to you later. You have time for that. So at this moment, when you're giving your two-minute pitch, you have to invite them to come to get curious about your work. Then once you have practiced your, com your, your content, you practice your speech. It's very important to uh, get a natural rhyme, uh, test how you pronounce your words, simplify complicated words if needed. If you know some words that you have difficult to pronounce, so try to be natural, use a conversational style, for instance. This example from that paper we mentioned earlier. For instance, the, that paper, the paper, sorry, the title is um, Impact of the Quality of Hydrological Forecast on the Management and Revenue, Revenue of Hydroelectric Reservoirs in France. So it's a very good title, written title, but sometimes it can be difficult to speak all that. So that's why you have to practice also. You put your name, you put where you come from, and you can, for instance, if the title allows a red, a hint for your aim. So your aim is to evaluate the impact of this and this and that, and hint for where you're going to present your study in France. This way, you don't need to present your study area because it's already said that. And then you come to your, your other slides and you try to put your the text. For instance, you take a sentence from your paper, but then you see, oh, I have to simplify the words. I cannot say the sentence as it was written. I have to put also a graphic that shows something to the audience and so on. And at the end you put, well, let's visit my pickle for instance. Well, you, by doing that, you check some things that first, you have to check if the words are there, if you can simplify something, for instance, if you can enhance it with nice graphics. The first slide, for instance, on your left, you can see that I took out the management and the revenue because it was too wordy for a first slide. I added some photo, for instance, to draw attention so people immediately understand what I'm talking about, reservoirs, water, and so on. You can also check if you can simplify further your graphics. So uh, this is uh, a little embodied here, but you can see that I well took some things out and I write where value is, where quality is, and so on. Now, these were the tips so for building your two, three slide uh, presentation. So uh, let's try to do it. So I was thinking when I was preparing this, uh, this talk, think, okay, I'm selling, I'm telling a lot of things, but am I going to do that, practice that? So I'm going to try to do here a two minute pitch talk. And I will ask you to pay attention to what I'm doing right or what I'm doing wrong, where I could improve. I'm pretty sure I'm going to make a lot of mistakes or do things very well. So whatever. Think about that. Let's see the test now, uh, how a two minute pitch could go, for instance, taking the same example as the paper we mentioned. <clears throat> I'm gonna prepare myself. So hello everybody. My name is Maria Elena Ramos. You can see here my co-authors and we come from INRAE, a research institute in France and from EDF, the electricity company in France. The study I'm gonna to present here today uh, is about reservoirs in France. So uh, our aim is to evaluate the impact of the quality of the hydrological forecasts on the revenue of hydroelectric reservoirs in France. To carry out this study, we uh, had to uh, establish a methodology and uh, the overview of this methodology has four steps. First step where we define what are our inflow forecasts, so we define forecasts with and without biases. Then we are going to use that and calculate this forecast for 10 catchments that are associated to 10 reservoirs. These reservoirs are parameterized, conceptually parameterized. And then we are going to use this in an optimization model. And this optimization model is also fed by the energy prices through all the years that we are evaluated. Finally, the fourth step, will be linking the quality and the value of the forecasts. For us, the value is the gains and losses from production. 
From this objective and methodology, we came to some results. One of them is that forecast quality is linked to economic value in the hydropower sector. It's also that overestimation generated the highest economic losses, as we can see in this graphic in, on the right. So why do you come to these results? Is it applicable, uh, can be applied everywhere? So for, to know more about that, please visit my PICO number 4.8. Thank you very much. Well, I finished my test now. It was a bit, well, I was a bit nervous. So <laughs> let's see, I don't know, what did I do wrong? So would you do what I say or do what I do? What could be improved? I don't know, I don't know. Simon, do you want to say some things or? <laughs> Sure. Um, obviously, you practiced it, so that was good bonus. <laughs> um, I think if you want to focus on improvements from my position here as the as the Zoom facilitator, the faces of our um, colleagues are always in the top right corner. So it's always good to be aware of, um, I suppose, what uh, the online audience will be seeing. So you might want to be aware that there might be people in the top right corner that might mask um, your presentation. Um, otherwise, I like to I like the arrows in there, kind of big question mark of why, what are we talking about here? Thank you. Any tips, Fabio, from your part? Yeah, I also like that you gave away your main points and you raised curiosity at the end by asking the question to the audience. Um, maybe. I can comment on on the fit, the last figure, which I don't think was colorblind friendly. So if you improve that, you can also include everyone in your audience, I guess. Great. Well, thank you very much, Simon and Fabio, for this uh, this uh, uh, feedback, which is very important for everybody. And sometimes we really don't realize that things like what Simon said, like okay, you be, be careful because online there will be people. Uh, occupying this space, there will be a, maybe some space occupied on the top and on the bottom with subtitles, for instance. So we have to be careful and attentive about that. You want people to read what is inside your your um, your slides, and of course about displays. I'm pretty sure Fabio will come back with other solutions uh, for for better displays. So, and now you get your que your questions also at the end if you have any more. Uh, uh, tips to give. So that's why uh, uh, a test, that's what a, was a test in real time, to tell you the truth, about this two-minute speech talk. And as you know, at EGU, you have the two-minute speech talk, and then you have the Pico screens for a longer and more detailed presentation. These are so um, examples. Here is one of our colleagues giving the pitch talk, and then you go to a screen it's your own screen, every presenter has one, and then you can explain more in details what you're gonna, uh, what you did and how and etc. So you have all this preparation that you can uh, go back and forth, the, the home page and etc. So you can talk to people and sometimes can be really crowded. So you have to think also about that. This is your time to present your research, to make your, your name known, to get your feedback. So on to the next presentation type, which is the 10 minute presentation. This is the more uh, common conference talk that you're so it's most likely to experience uh, in the wild. Um, for example, in EGU at the General Assembly this year, um, we have uh, 10 minute presentations, which includes the time for both presenting and questions. Um, some of the key points to keep in mind as we go into detail is first, make sure you're telling a story that is a key thread linking the beginning and the end of your presentation that allows uh, the audience to keep coming back to you. Make sure they have a context to explore your um, work with or to keep in mind. Um, this could be how you structure it. So for example, beginning with a question and narrowing down to a conclusion. Um, other key things is member author accreditation. These are scientific um, uh, presentations. So if you don't use, uh, if you use work you haven't offered, include accreditation. Make sure your text is readable, that it's a large font, and that you don't have any uh, jargon or perhaps really detailed descriptions. Be aware of your time. If you're given 10 minutes, is that inclusive of questions like in the General Assembly or not? And last, 
Um, remember that your voice is your focus, that your presentation is as what you're saying, um, and it shouldn't be distracting from it either. So with that, uh, like back to you, uh, Helena, about the 10 minute presentation. Thank you. So uh, I will also give some of my tips or advice for 10 minute presentation. So first of all, what you see here is exactly the same as you have in the other one. So again, picture yourself, where will I be? Who will be the audience? Inform yourself about the session. So this is again, a picture of one of the rooms we had in Vienna at the GU in 2016 or 17. Imagine where you are gonna be. How is the environment of your presentation? Then plan the content. Now you have 10 minutes, but be very careful. 10 minutes is for your presentation and for those questions, those questions that you said in the beginning that you wanted to have at the end. So plan that you should not occupy your 10 minutes with only your talk. You should take seven, eight minutes and leave minutes for question and answers. Well, let's do the calculation again. If I take between 0 0.8 to 1.2 minutes per slide, I would need to have six to seven slides max for a 10 minute presentation. Is it too long, too short? The question is not there. The question, this is what you have and you have to do with it. So no more than two, three messages per slide. This is the norm. So plan your content, draw it, your plan of action. How am I going to do first? My title, my aim, my name, affiliation, and how to contact me, maybe an email, whatever. And then my motivation, my methodology, and the results. And then at the end, I put some conclusions and way forth. And again, how to contact me. Here, I put one slide for motivation, one slide for methodology, and one, two, three slides for results. Do not overload the audience. Remember that this is also something you check it saying, I don't want it to overload my audience. So do not overload it. Now you can, of course, reflect about that. Is it fine with my work? Fine with my presentation? So maybe you say, no, I'm not going to present three results, different results. I'm going to present two results. And I will emphasize more the methodological steps I, I, I had. I, I, took to do this work. So I will put two slides of methodology and then two slides of results, for instance. You are the one who has to know, who have to find the right balance according to the strongest points of your work. Is it the methodology I want to emphasize or are the results? So once you define that, you have to start planning. For instance, this is an example. I can have step one, I generate a synthetic forecast and I did this and that. I put an example and some uh, visual aspects that could uh, interest the audience. So Fabio is going to talk more about the visual stuff, but I can do step two methodology. Again, not too much text, but enough for me to know how to tell my story, to link what I'm talking about through the different slides I'll have. These are purely examples, for instance. Now you can say, okay, there is one slide that is really, really very important, it's the motivation slide. This is the one that will help you to feel at ease, confident and relaxed because it's just the second one. Your title, your aim, your name, you know, you know how to say them, to plan them, to write them. But your motivation, how you're gonna tell the audience that this is important. So it will help you to feel at ease. It will help your audience to see that the broader implication of your research, the importance of it. Do not neglect this slide. This is really very important. Why are you doing all this? Why are you taking 10 minutes of, I don't know, 30, 50, 100 people to tell your story? For instance, a motivation is like, this is a test. Motivation, hydropower is very important for society, river flow have biases, and my research question is, and then I repeat my title. And what I would say to you, no, 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 don't do this. Don't send your audience to sleep. You don't need to repeat your title. Try to be creative. Simon mentioned that in the beginning also. Try to really attract the attention of your audience. For instance, you could start with the question, why hydropower could benefit from good forecasts? Why are we interested in having good forecasts to manage hydropower reservoirs? You do not need to repeat your title. Tell something different. Tell something that you show this is your story. 
not everybody can say the same. You are the only one who can tell your motivation to the audience. And then, of course, you plan, you practice your speech. It's not the same as a lecture. You have to practice at home. Simplify all the words. If you see something you're not getting well, if it's too long, too full of things, try to simplify. Never do the opposite. Not Never put more. Just put less. Remember that people have different background. And in the audience, you have experts, but also those that are just there curious to know more about that topic so you have to embrace all this audience people also are relying on their power of hearing and sight so you have to take that into account they don't have a textbook they then don't go home and have everything already explained in different uh, ways so you have to be clear to speak slow to talk clearly about your work and you have to think about that person that is sitting in the back of the room are they getting the key points? Are they getting my message? That is going to be important. Finally, of course, this was for the 10 minute presentations and the two minutes presentation. You also have post presentation. I would just say you also have to pick picture yourself on the poster halls, how it will be, where it will be, who will be there. Think of your poster as a conversation starter. You, have to have something to attract the audience and then you start a conversation but this is for Simon for Fabio sorry just right now just my last uh, uh, slide and message is for you to think about you're telling a story your story and it has to be passionate and you have to be passionate on that you have to love it and make the audience also want to know much more about that thank you very much Simon great thank you uh, Helena so we're moving on to our next uh, speaker now, who'll be uh, talking about the poster. I think it's got a slight teaser there. Um, yeah, so the next presentation will be the common conference poster. And one of the key points to uh, keep in mind as we go forward uh, is that firstly, knows the size and the format of the poster. You don't want to get to the display hall and have your poster awkwardly positioned or running over the display board. Um, Start with the big key message and funnel it down to the final detail. This doesn't have to be the title necessarily, but the key, key takeaway you want the audience to leave with or at least catch their attention with. Uh, keep it simple. Don't clutter your poster uh, and make use of the empty space to provide breathing room or emphasis to your poster uh, points. Make sure it's readable, that the font size is big enough and the colors don't clash with each other. And make sure it's accessible. So does the audience know the jargon you use? And are the graphics uh, readable to those who are colorblind, for example? With that, uh, Fabio would like to take it away. Thank you, Simon. Um, okay. So yeah, my part is more about the visuals when we communicate science through visuals rather than voice and our ears. Um, and yeah, I start with the poster as Simon just introduced. So what's an EQ poster? Um, it's an usually around A0 landscape format. You can see a picture of a poster hall at EQ. Uh, you typically have lots and lots of posters, uh, lots of people walking by. And um, usually the people walking by just have a, a little bit of time to look at your poster and decide whether they should stop their journey through this poster um, alleys. Um, it's in print, your poster is printed out and then put on the poster board. Um, yeah, it's a big hall full of other posters. Um, there are experts in your field walking by, but there are certainly also non-experts walking by. And your poster will be up approximately one day. And there's a presence time of uh, around one hour, 45, uh, minutes, which doesn't mean you have to talk. Um, you spend uh, the whole hour talking about your poster. You should still present it in like a few minutes max, and then just repeat when new people coming by. Um, and then the the last bit will be about the EQ displays or um, supplementary material. Um, this is a free format, so you can basically upload whatever you want. Uh, whether this is still images, PDFs, presentations, 
or even movies. And it's purely digital. It's on each use sphere. And so it's kind of empty of other displays. So it doesn't have to compete with other displays at the same time. And again, there will be experts and non-experts coming by, and they will be up for a long time, around two months, and then maybe even permanently, if you decide so. Uh, so what are the cornerstones of poster and display design uh, from a graphical standpoint? Um, so first of all, I think it's very important that your uh, presentations are accessible to everyone, even people with, for example, coral, color vision deficiencies. Um, they should be effective. Sorry for the lost F there. Um, in terms of your work time, so in, in, to create, it should be kind of easy to do and quickly to do, so we don't waste too much research time. Um, but they should also be effective in terms of what you want to achieve it. So they should communicate um, flawlessly and efficiently. So the key messages for my part really are, um, know that people uh, understand not what you present, what, but what they perceive. So put yourself into the people coming at your poster and looking at it. Um, and then also you need to know that we do not all perceive the same way. So we can't all see the same colors, for example, or we don't have the same uh, background knowledge than you might have. And then always the surrounding affects also your message. So think about where your presentation is, as Helena already pointed out, this is kind of key here. So again, I will use the example of the um, research introduced before, um, which is this one here about hydrological forecasts. And I, I came up with a, a kind of fake poster example that I made myself, so I don't look at it too closely might not make too much sense, but this is a, a common poster I often see when I walk through these big alleys of, of poster boards at each U. And at first sight, it might look like a sensible poster, but I will show you how to do it better. And so this is the version I think would work much better in, in different aspects. And I will go through these uh, now. So um, my whole presentation will First, cover a few um, general graphic communication aspects, then go also into what you can do with texts and how you should do it to improve your presentation. And then again, have the two parts, uh, the posters and the displays, with some specific tips on these. So first up is the graphic communication tools. So when you look at this text graphic communication, it appears to you probably as if it has two different colors or as if it was written in with a gradient of color. But it is actually the same kind of green bluish, green bluish color for the text. Just the background, this gradient in the background makes it look like there was a gradient on it as well. So remember, the background changes what you present as well. Also, if you look long enough on this slide and then I change to the next one, it looks as this slide also have, has a gradient in the background, which is kind of because your eyes got used to something and now pretend to see something else. So you can't always fully trust your eyes. And that brings me to prevent uh, pitfalls. And you have to know that there is no one right way to do a good poster or a good figure, um, but you can avoid some of these crucial pitfalls. Um, so here's a list of a few of these pitfalls which I could come up with. Um, there are a few that are just here to avoid. So for example, unreadable annotations or put too many things onto your poster. But then there are a few that are really critical. So if you get them wrong, your poster kind of fails to communicate um, your message. And this could be if it's inaccessible due to uh, non-perceptionally uniform color maps, um, if you use faulty scales, etc. I try to avoid these. Um, just to highlight a few examples, color, one of my favorite topics. Um, I mentioned before, not all see color the way you do. So if you go to this um, kind of standard poster design that I made, um, this graphic here is not color vision deficiency friendly. So at first sight, it looks okay to everyone who can see all these colors. 
but then you have to realize that the caller in this figure is an information carrier. So it connects the data um, legend, so what data that is to the actual graph shows. If you can't connect these colors, to you, your graphic fails and the viewer has no idea what you talk about. So if you convert these to black and white, just desaturated, you can easily test it for color vision deficiency friendliness. And that's what I did in the back. So you see here in this case, um, these lines are not distinguishable anymore. Um, you can just improve that by adding a lightness uh, change for all the different colors. So we have dark red and light blue and so on, and then they remain visible to everyone who can see and even in black and white. Um, the same applies to maps. Um, this uh, first side also looks like a good graphic, green to red, but then again, if you make the test um, desaturated, you can see that it's, it's not possible anymore to distinguish the individual values. So you can use just a scientific accessible color map that goes from light, light green in this case, to dark red. Um, and you can see in the test, you can easily um, still recognize the different values on the map itself. And on top of it, I think the original image becomes much more intuitive also, as it goes from low values to high values, from light colors to dark colors. Um, there's a lot of um, useful resources online. So um, I provide color vision deficiency friendly color palettes, which you can see find on my web page for free. And then there's tons of blog posts online. I really uh, like the ones by Lisa Charlotte Muth um, and the link is given here. Then another graphic element that we use a lot of on presentations like posters and displays is typefaces. Remember all the typefaces have voices um, for titles and for posters where we have just short text uh, we tend to use sans serif fonts, and for long text, that would be more in a in a publication where the paragraph um, is long and needs to be read through. Then we would use serif typefaces. Um, examples are Helvetica, Arial, Open Sans, and Futura for non or sans serif fonts that you could use. Um, one, one other visualization tool that um, is not very highly regarded by scientists is to add empty space on your presentations. Uh, this is very important though, and it can help to, to make your presentation much more effective. So in this example here, I used um, a lot of empty space um, on the front to kind of highlight the, the conclusion here written in bold text. So you, your, your eyes are kind of drawn to this location and that's just thanks to the empty space. So don't be afraid to leave a lot of empty space on your presentations. Um, yeah, I, I, I mentioned a lot of this in, in a previous uh, webinar, which can, you can find online as well, if you Google for it. And then uh, come to text. Um, here, we shouldn't mind jargon. Um, for those who don't know, and for scientists, um, the, here's the definition. Jargon is a word or a phrase that loses or changes meaning when used with people outside the field. And an example of jargon is actually given in this definition. Uh, it's the word field. Uh, for some people, field just means you know, an area of open land. For us in Switzerland, usually including a cow. Um, but of course, for us, it's kind of clear that it should be a particular branch of study. Um, so this is a kind of extreme example, but um, Targon is also often used within research groups or, or research fields. And when you talk to people outside these kind of groups, then it becomes really difficult to still communicate effectively. So think about Targon and whether you should use it or not. Acronyms is another. Um, example that you should uh, take care of. Um, they can save a lot of time, for example, LLSVP or ECMWF, but um, they can quickly alienate outside the audience. So avoid if possible. And also physical units, I 
too often see them wrong or confusing. Um, try to stick to SI units, proper units at, at least. A good example in geoscience is the million years dimension. Um, these are common uh, kind of letters, combination of letters that are used to represent millions of years as dimension. And of course, the two lower ones are wrong. So there's no dots in actual dimensions. There's also no plural in actual dimensions. So S in this case stands for second rather than years plural. So don't use these, but use those. Um, scientific communication text in general, um, try to use short and instructive titles. So I learned that when I wrote uh, this news and views on um, sinking plates on Venus. So I wanted to have a really cool title and suggested something like what happens on Venus stays on Venus. Then they told me, uh, if you read the title, you really have no idea what it's about. So, and that's what you really want on first sight to kind of communicate what it's about. So sinking plates on Venus is short and clear and um, gives away like the topic quickly. And then also it helps to give away your main point, your conclusions quickly, often. And keep your sentences short and clear, just for better readability. Um, and then it's good to simplify your texts. This doesn't mean you have to dumb it down. Um, think about it like as if you would widen your audience. So if you sim simplify your text, you like the same um, is the case for, for models that we do. Um, we kind of simplify it to a point where it's most effective to communicate something, as with the heart. Um, you know which shape um, is the perfect one to give to someone who you like. Um, I like this statement here. Uh, don't underestimate your reader's intelligence, but also don't overestimate their knowledge of a particular field. So young scientists often try to or, or believe that everyone in the audience uh, knows more than they do but it's actually not the case usually you are um, the, the the most knowledgeable expert on your topic so um yeah keep that in mind okay so let's come to poster design a few specifics before you start to create your poster um ask yourself what's a poster um, I think this is something like that a quick and concise overview of some research so that means for example don't put your post papers abstract on your poster your poster should be your abstract right it should give an overview and then it really helps for me I try to force myself to write these answers down so what's your message that's something like we found that or also know uh, who's your audience. And in, uh, in the case of EGU, this is a broad range of geoscientists, including experts and non-experts. And then also be aware of your figures environment, um, which in this case is a poster board in the big EGU General Assembly poster hub. And by doing that, you can make a much better poster. Um, then there's this better poster design by Mark Morrison. He's thought a lot about how to best present a poster um, visually in a, in a big conference like EGU. And this is what he came up with. So the main finding uh, is the central part of it, and it should be you know, in the center, easily readable for people that just walk by quickly. And then you have more details on the side. And of course, when you interact with the presenter, you get more details as well. So if we convert our example poster into uh, one that is based on the better poster design, um, it looks like this. And this is really uh, a good poster, I think, because um, it has some elements that really help to communicate uh, your research. So it uses a clear font that is easily readable by everyone. It uses simple elements that kind of make it simple to navigate through your posters. Um, it uses empty space. Again, people use empty space. And um, there's macro empty space, which, uh, as I mentioned before, kind of gives highlight to some um, graphic element. And there's micro uh, empty space, which just divides individual elements clearly. So they are clearly visible 
if you want to know about motivation, you can clearly go there. Um, it also fulfills some graphic principles um, like contrast. So the biggest contrast that stands out more is your conclusion with the blue color. Um, it um, applies symmetry. So it's kind of nice to look at with both side panels there. It has hierarchy, which is very important. So you guide the viewer's eye uh, first to the conclusion, then title, and then all the details. So it's a very good um, poster design and actually that all the templates for your different software uh, you can find on sync.org. Um, then a good test to kind of check your poster, whether it's effective or not, um, is to do the highway billboard test. So imagine your poster on a highway billboard and the drivers uh, passing by have around 10 seconds to get the main message and decide whether they should take the next exit to your, to your poster or not. So I think this works quite well with the uh, example B, but doesn't it with the example A. And then uh, the better poster design is also very useful because it saves you a lot of work time. It is kind of time effective to create. So I just I, I tried this myself. I just put my own research on in this template and I could do it kind of quickly. So I came up with these three examples. Um, of course, you can then keep working on it. So if you have more time to spend on your poster, of course, you maybe can improve it and do something like this that is still kind of um, you based on the on the template, but um, kind of looks a bit different and is more personal, maybe. Great. Thanks, uh, Fabio. Um, so we're just going to move to the final presentation type, which Fabio has mentioned, which are the display design or display materials. The display materials or display design are the supplementary material, which are displayed in support of conference work. For example, at EGU23, display materials are hosted on EGU Sphere, the EGU Open Access and Online Repository, uh, which Fabio already mentioned. They are online for two months. Um, using EGU Sphere means you can provide additional information to support uh, your work in the sessions, which you won't be able to do otherwise. And also means your presentation data and material is stored in the cloud ahead of travel. Um, the display designs, uh, they are flexible, uh, with flexibility for format of presentations, uh, from graphics to videos to data files, as Fabio mentioned previously. A um, few key things to uh, keep in mind about this is to keep the material self-explanatory, as you will not be there to guide people through your graphics, for example, um, to make sure the format works for different devices, such as a square format. And to that you can make your materials interactive or by including, for example, links to uh, other websites or uh, further reading. Um, so with that, Javier, we'd like to continue and move on to the final section. Yes. Okay. So display materials. Um, again, same as with poster, before you start, ask yourself, what's a display? or what's a supplementary material. Um, again, it's a kind of quick overview of your research. And then again, don't put your paper's abstract on it. It's again, kind of summary of your paper itself. Um, write down again, these three um, points, know your message and we found that, know your audience, know the presentation's environment. And in this case, it's kind of online on each use field. The displays can be any format really, um, but they, in contrast to the posters, they need to be self-explanatory. So they just stand on their own. So you won't be there to explain it. And also you should add the copyright statement. By default, I think each you will um, license it by uh, CC by 4.01, which just means everyone can use your material as long as they um, cite you. So I thought about this uh, a few years back when I designed uh, my first display, what would be the best format to do that? And then I really liked the square interactive PDF format. So I made a few of those. 
um, one uh, to show you why I think it, it's useful. Um, so it would be this one down here. It has like square slides of a PDF. Um, it's very versatile for multiple screens. So again, you think about how people will access, access it. Um, some of them will, will access it on the desktop computer, but I think more and more people will also browse through the displays um, on their mobile phones. So in the square format kind of allows to adjust it in either landscape or portrait um, uh, ratio. And so you kind of use up the real estate of your screens uh, effectively if you if you do it in, in a square form. Um, also, you can add links to your PDFs and this then, oh, sorry, there's a lot of text um, on it, but you can add links to, for one, make it interactive so people can actually click through it and go where they want to go. And then you can also add external links where people can find resources on the internet or even your, po your, your paper. Okay, and finally, um, I'll just give you some uh, poster making tips, uh, which also apply to this place. Um, yeah, best is if you make it self explanatory, also the poster, because it stands there the whole day and you're not at your poster for the entirety of the time. So um, it, it's really useful to do that. Add your contact details so people can find you, ask questions afterwards. Um, it's good to, if you add links to external resources, like the paper or so, and the, a really good way nowadays is to add QR codes. You can do that online. And then also state whether sharing is permitted. So each you offers these patches you can add to your poster, either to allow sharing or to permit sharing. And then accessibility. Um, you can simulate color vision deficiency, as I mentioned, um, for example, on the internet, on the website Coblis, or you can simply desaturate your poster to see whether it works in black and white. Um, be open, as Elena also mentioned, be open for feedback. Um, we have never learned enough. Um, we keep improving. Uh, make your figures reproducible, um, because you will reuse them in various different presentations and so on. So it saves you a lot of time. And then um, a good tip is also to use open access software or cheap software, because you know we're often on, on uh, non-permanent contracts. And if you, if you change your job, you might lose access to some software that you have had used before. So yeah, this is just an example. And then finally, acknowledge others' work. This is kind of important. So add some references to your poster. You don't have to print the entire references page with pages and, and journal issues and so on, but make um, a short reference list um, to cite data, scientific concepts, and even uh, reuse graphics. Um, and here are a few resources that help you make posters. I mentioned the better poster template, which you can find on sync.org. The scientific color maps ensure that everyone can read your scientific visualizations. Sync.org has a lot of geoscience um, graphics online that are free to use, um, as long as you cite the, the people who made it. And then you can also use Imageo. Um, it's each use kind of open access photography collection. Um, which is also geoscience based, of course. So to conclude my part, um, try to avoid graphic pitfalls, such as pro um, using improper scales, test for accessibility. Um, know your graphic tools, communicate for and not to the audience. So think about how they kind of listen to you, how they look at your poster instead of just thinking of yourself um, presenting it. Then follow the billboard test to just make it effective. And if you can use and share community tools, um, again, for example, via sync.org or 
imachio.ichio. And finally, just my last tip, um, kind of put your own style on all your presentation and put your heart in it and it will be just perfect. Thanks for listening. And back to you, Simon. Excellent. Uh, thanks both of you for giving your presentation today. We're quickly running out of time, uh, but perhaps one question before you, uh, we all disappear. Um, we touched on quite a few presentation types today, but one perhaps lesser done presentation is the long form one where people perhaps get invited for perhaps a keynote or um, perhaps a 30 minute uh, talk or something like that. Um, I suppose you have any thoughts, ideas, how to approach a more long form presentation at all? Is it for me, Simon? Yes. Mm. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that's true. We we focus here on the shorter ones, but uh, there are also the longer ones that or the invited ones. I think that one thing that um, many things apply the same way, tell your story. Uh, one thing that I think we can also, uh, we, we have to think more when you have longer presentations is the structure of it in terms of steps of, uh, it, it could be related to what uh, Fabio said on the, the poster, you have to have uh, hierarchic steps. So people say, okay, that's one, that's two, that's three, that's four. So you know where to go. So in a longer presentation, you usually have to have like uh, sometimes a plan explicitly if it's longer than 40, 45 minutes to say, well, I'm in the introduction, now I'm talking about data, now I'm talking about methods or results. But if you don't have, you don't need to have that structure in an invited talk of 20 or 30 minutes, but you may have to have something wrapped up by colors or by uh, um, uh, letters, A, B, C, or one, two, three, or like start, I have three big message to tell you. So first one this, second one that, third one that. That helps to keep the people attentive during the long presentation. Thanks, Haina. So since she needs to make sure there's a key structure and uh, a rhythm to these long presentations that keeps the audience engaged, such as uh, stretching it through a series of questions or some research. Yeah, thank you. Um, with that, we're actually out of time. Uh, so I have to quickly thank our two speakers, uh, Maria Helena Ramos and Fabio Kumeri, uh, for their talks today. Thanks to the participants for joining. This has been quite an in-depth uh, little discussion for the tips and tricks uh, you can have for your presentation for the upcoming General Assembly. Um, I'll just note that recording of this webinar will be available on the uh, EGU YouTube channel uh, next week on Wednesday. So if you want to come back, review the presentation, um, or look at the slide, any slide in particular, that's the best way to uh, do it. So check out our YouTube channel uh, Wednesday next week. Otherwise, um, I'll close the webinar. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending. <laughs>